Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome back to theCUBE's live coverage of the Red Hat Summit here at the Colorado Convention Center. I'm your host, Rebecca Knight, sitting alongside my co-host and analyst, Rob Strache. Rob, it is so clear that it, devising a comprehensive AI strategy is exceedingly complex and that the businesses that will be successful are the ones who are able to manage that complexity. Yeah, this is not Ronco, set it and forget <laughs> it, just yet. I, I think there's things that are coming that will help people get to that next level from an automation perspective, and I, I think that is great that we have the folks with us here to uh, discuss that. Indeed we do, so I'd like to welcome two of our next guests. We have Satish Balakrishnan, he is the Vice President and GM of the Ansible Business Unit. Welcome Satish. Thank you Rebecca and Rob, good to be here. And we have Richard Henshaw, the Head of Product Management for Ansible at Red Hat. Thank you so Glad much for coming. Thanks. Yeah, for being, for returning to theCUBE. Yeah, yes. Is it your first time Satish? No, it's, I'm No, you're a veteran, yeah, you're an old, you're old hat. So, uh, Richard, I want to start with you and, yeah. and, and riff a little bit on what Rob was just saying before is, why is you using an end-to-end -end automation platform important for enterprises to reach, to reach their goals? Well, I think you know, we've been doing this now you know, 10 years, longer. Well, actually, ultimately, all IT has been around doing automation for longer. But it's, it's essential. Now, we've got to this point where we can't operate at the scale we need to with the complexity that we have, with the availability of skills, the availability of resources to change the way we need to without having something of us as a foundation that lets us focus our attention on achieving the outcomes we want. It's not about just the technology of how we do something, it's about having a place that people can go to, that they know they can get easier access, simpler access, the, the capabilities they need to do what they want to do. It's not the technology itself, it's the, it's the, the goal they're trying to get to. I want to fix something, I want to make it go away, I want to make it be repeatable, make it be consistent. Make it as easy as possible for them to do that. That's the way to change people into the sort of transformation phase of achieving what businesses want to do. Move faster, be more consistent, be more efficient. Yeah. Oh. No, I think uh, Rich covered it all. I okay, think so Satish, I, I think one of the things that I found in talking to organizations and is that they're taking a different look and reevaluating automation in general. And a lot of times, I think they're looking at it as being more mission critical. Can you kind of see your perspective on that? Yeah, absolutely, Rob. So I think, uh, you know, what, as Rich said, right, end-to-end -end automation is no longer a nice to have, it's a necessity now. In this modern world of hybrid complexity and everything that's going on, it is really not optional anymore. But I think, I like the fact that it is mission critical. Because without doing this, you're not going to be able to be successful in your future. And the reason is, I think, one is customers are starting to look at automation more strategically. It's no longer happening in silos, it's happening across the entire enterprise. And the good news is they have a tool like Ansible Automation Platform that can do it across every one of these domains, right? We can do every one of these things, and Rich and team have built a great roadmap of doing everything with Ansible, right? You can do compute, storage, networking, everything, operating system, patching. The use cases are unlimited, so that's actually great. The second thing is we've also had a lot of innovations like event-driven Ansible and other things, which allow you to make your tools more actionable, right? That's super important again, and that's why it's mission critical, because we are embedding automation into all of your mission critical workflows within your company. Yeah. So I think, you know, that's why I think, you know, enterprises are seriously looking at automation and they're considering it mission critical. Well, I, I think, again, and the, the name of the show here is Red Hat Summit and Ansible Fest. So, I mean, very, very yep. apropos to have you on at the end of the day, too, at least, because a, a, a lot of the discussion has really revolved around, in fact, I sat with, uh, I, I won't say which state in the country it was, but I sat with their IT folk who are here for Ansible Fest. I had lunch with them and uh, it was really interesting to see because that, that's exactly why they were here, was to get exposure to how do, how do they continue across different platforms and how do they get experience with OpenShift and OpenShift AI and how they're going to look at automation. Are you seeing that as really uh, been one of the big draws to Ansible Fest and Red Hat Summit in general? Is people really getting exposure to these different technologies? Yeah, absolutely, right? I think one is the technologies, second is the hybrid cloud footprint, right? And more importantly, as Rich said, people have been asked to do more with less these days. 
right? And they have so many complex tools in their uh, disparate tools that often look like they're doing the same thing. How are they getting the maximum value out of these tools? So they got to automate, they got to make it more efficient and make sure they get the best ROI of their IT infrastructure today. Yeah, and, and Richard, you were talking about the fact that it is in all the areas, like if you're in Rosas and AWS or wherever, you can actually use Ansible in each, you can use it in Azure, you can use it in Google, you can use it on-prem, you can use it at other providers. Yeah. And so you have that option to use it where you need to, because you, you know, I mean, every customer likes to say they're unique, right? They all feel in their own world that they're special, and the thing is, to some extent they are but they also have massive amounts of commonality, but they also have that subtle little bit of variance, which just makes their life different. They chose a, a different decision 10 years ago. They chose a certain platform. They chose a, a, certain, a certain investment. And so what automation they need to do can vary because automation's already there. But then they move out to Edge. They move into a different cloud. They change, they replatform in the data center. You know, how do you build automation in at that point? And that, that ubiquity, that consistency across all those places, that's what makes Ansible so useful to so many people, but also in so many different ways. Richard, how does automated policy as code fit into this idea? So this, um, this has been like the natural evolution over the last few years. You know, we've, we talked, you know, infrastructure as code has been in the industry. We had config as code, configuration management with Ansible. We talked about ops as code last year, and policy as code was always the next intention. It's like, I can, how do I trust the automation that I'm running. At the moment, we, do the, we trust the same way. I mean, security people don't trust anybody, right? <laughs> Let's just say that, right? But we trust people the same way. I like staying employed, I'm a decent person, I don't want to do the wrong thing, I don't want him to be angry at me. Um, you know, so you don't do the wrong thing at work, right? But now we're going to add, well, I've got more complexity, more places, I need to get more fine-grained on what's possible where, not just based on the role, and especially as we increase the aperture of who can automate, more controls required to encourage more trust from those parts of the organization that maybe don't like to trust people. You know, and then you think about then you think about AI and you open a whole new world, a whole new Pandora's box, so to speak. Yeah, yeah because I, I think again, it's again, you're from across the pond there where they actually have regulations around certain yes. stuff as well, and being employed yep. is always a good thing. <laughs> yes. Uh, and you know, you have the AI Act coming yep. out, uh, and being able to have guardrails around this stuff. Yep would seem like a big piece. And with all of, I mean, all of day one was, you know, here's how you go from Podman with Instruct Lab into RHEL AI, into OpenShift AI, it would seem a natural fit for that progression to have those guardrails be in something like Ansible. Yeah, and we have to integrate into that bigger, you know, policy is going to have to be across the board now, and we have to integrate into that story, and all customers will be doing their version of that story in different ways, in the same maturity levels that we've seen with automation and container adoption and cloud adoption. And we need to make sure that they can seamlessly integrate that into the automation they do. And that's how we'll scale what AI is going to bring in that next sort of wave of, in, of innovation and enhancement. It, and I think, you know, we were talking about it before we went live, the customer example you, you had about, hey, they did it, this, they were doing RAG and, you know, retrieval augmented generation, AI, uh, you know, kind of where a lot of people start. In fact, we have our own RAG and our own LLM and that's how we started out. And again, it's a lot, right? Getting up and running is a lot and then, oh, by the way, now I want to go and change a model or I want to do some other stuff or I want to reconfigure it. Tell us the story there, because I, I thought that was really compelling. Yeah, no, it, it is a very compelling story, Rob, right? So I think the way we look at it is, right, AI is a natural progression of automation, right? Automation is something that we manually do. AI is machines automating machines, right? Machines automating tools, processes, machines automating other technologies. That's what AI is really, right? Uh, the example that I was quoting was from this morning where MapFray, right, uh, they mentioned in the Ansible Fest keynote, and if you guys haven't watched it, uh, there's a recording there. They talked about how they tried to do AI without automation, and they had a RAG success rate of 3%, and then how that exponentially grew after they built automation. Because unless you have an automated foundation, you're not going to be very effective in taking advantage of AI in enterprise IT, right? AI is not a solution for technical debt or for broken ops, right? You need to have all of those fixed in order to be more effective in taking advantage of AI. The other, other thing as with EDA and other innovations we've introduced over the years, 
every company in the world is introducing AI. So your observability stack, your ITSM stack, every one of them has AI. Those insights, those data is being generated, those insights are not going to be useful to you if it's going to be caught by a human being three months later, because you can now use event-driven Ansible or automate to immediately take action on those things, right? That's a very important thing. The other thing we are doing with AI for Ansible is, you know, we have Ansible Lightspeed with Watson Code Assistant, which allows us to bridge the skill gaps that we have with using automation, because, you know, Ansible made automation accessible, shareable, right, consumable, it made it easier, but now we're actually taking it to the next level where we're using AI to basically help drive more automation. Both, both of you, uh, Satish and Richard, are really describing, I, th I think you even called it a journey, and, and what you're talking about in terms of the breaking down of silos and the changing of the skill sets and the, the greater need for collaboration um, and, and how roles are becoming less functional and requiring much more cross-disciplinary work, I mean, this is so much change management. I'm, I'm curious to hear from both of you how you approach this and how you work with customers because it really requires a massive culture shift in addition to, 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 to changing the technology itself. And Richard, it's, do you want to start? It's a lot of conversation. And I think what we have to do is show, you have to try and find something that's valuable to someone. You don't just do it for the sake of it. You have to have a problem. You have to have something that needs to be fixed. But it's just setting people up for the right mindset change. And I think that's the, sometimes the biggest part of this is that getting people prepared to change, right? And prepared to change in a way that they're willing to change participate is so in. Change so hard. It is. <laughs> Only if I want to do it am I prepared to change, right? But people don't usually want to. So, so just really going through those conversations talking about how we measure successful automation, how we design organizations where, and this isn't just like me saying, hey, do it this way. This is like, I've seen this organization be really successful over here doing this. I've seen another one over there not be so successful because they didn't do certain things. And sometimes us, us as Red Hat and Ansible having that wide view across so many customers who've been successful gives us a really good place to advise other customers on what makes, gives them the best opportunity to be successful and give them, you know, learn the lessons that others have, have learned the hard way. We can help them in the easy way. Yeah, I'll add on to that, right? So I think change is hard, but change is what is permanent, so it's always there, right? Uh, I think the way we do it, to Richard's point, we actually have some programs around it. So we first encourage customers to think of automation as mission critical, make it a strategic initiative. Because unless you make it a strategic initiative, Automation is one of those interesting things that you know, people assume others will do, but they themselves don't do, right? So we want to make it a strategic initiative. Second thing is you want to build a community of practice or a center of excellence that basically enables automation within the organization. Third is you want to build, get a tool like Ansible Automation Platform that's comprehensive, that basically can do all these domains, all the use cases that you have in the enterprise, right? And then you find these use cases that Rich talked about, go attack those use cases and show the value because a lot of times we only look at the value that it's providing to IT, but what's the value it's providing to the business because that is very important and we forget to measure that. And that's how you basically you know, show success and that success breeds more success. Yes, yeah. and, and I think one of the things that I've always found exciting and I know it, it's really drawn in a community around Ansible has been the fact that it's so open and there's so many different partners that are building into the Ansible ecosystem because, I mean, again, another conversation, the, the, this other company was sitting there and they're like, hey, I learned how to go and use Ansible to actually update the port identification on blah, 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 switch router thingy in my network and, you know, I. Didn't, the API didn't work, but I was able to use this to build a playbook with the CLI. Is that where you see a lot of the community comes together and a lot of the partners really join in on that? Yeah, it's, it's, the, it's the commonality. Right? Everybody's got that same problem they want to fix, so therefore you find a way to give them the method to fix it, then they all come together. And, and like I say, we said earlier, you know, people are, everybody's unique, but they all have those shared challenges, those shared problems. And it, it's really always you know, very interesting to watch people that are, are so resolutely, this is just the way I work, come together and it slowly breaks down that silo and then the collaboration starts. Then you start to have more empowerment in the workforce. 
And that same model applied against how Ansible was so successful in the community because those partners wanted to give that same thing. And the alternative is they build it themselves, which doesn't bring everybody together because you haven't, we're not working in silos anymore, we're working across the board. And it goes back to that first question. This is about doing end to end and if you have to all invest in a similar yeah. capability to do end to end. Yeah, that's exactly right, right? So we have people trying to solve one problem, then somebody else solving another problem for the same vendor, and then the vendor takes notice and says, hey, why don't I do all of this and make it better and make it official? And then that's why we have you know, community version, then we have validated content, which we say, hey, this work, and then we have certified, because partners come to us and say, hey, can we certify this and we'll support this? Uh, and that's how it evolves, and that's why you know Ansible is really successful as an ecosystem of uh, partners, as well as you know, uh, working to solve problems that other partners are trying to solve. Excellent, a great, a fine note to end on. Satish yeah. and Richard, both, thank you very much for yeah, coming on theCUBE. A really oh, fascinating conversation. Thanks. I'm Rebecca Knight for Rob Strache. That does it for theCUBE's live coverage of Red Hat Summit for today. We will be back tomorrow for day three of the Red Hat Summit. I hope you'll join us. You are watching theCUBE, the leader in technology enterprise news and analysis.